right, so welcome to Scalability Through Open Source Hygiene. And my name is Rhea Shalnot. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a clue on how to remember my name if you don't already know me, although I think half the people in this room already know who I am anyway. But my first name is Rhea. I adore pizza. And so guess what my GitHub handle is? Well done. My GitHub handle is indeed Pizza Rhea. And my last name is Shalnot, which I married into. I didn't ask for this name. But when I was a professor, adjunct professor at a law school, I used to tell my students that if they didn't participate, they shall not pass my class. <laughs> So, or you can use the Gandalf thing, you shall not pass as well. And that's how you will remember my name. And I'm here because I am the open source compliance manager at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Not Hewlett Packard, we spun off from them about nine years ago. We focus on enterprise data center, edge to cloud, IoT. We own the Cray supercomputer line lots of exciting open source projects, including Chapel programming language for parallel programming. We have SmartSim for data modeling, Spiffy Spire for security, and Gromit, which is a web front end UI user experience type application. So invest a lot in open source and contribute to open source as well. I'm a big fan of everything open source and I kind of consider myself the cheerleader for it at HPE. And I'm here with Lynn Westfall. So could you introduce yourself? Well, yes, I am Lynn Westfall, but I'm also known as the Modem Lisa. That has been my handle, company, moniker, and GitHub handle um, since 1999, not GitHub, but the modem Lisa. Uh, when I was 17, my mom asked me if I, what I wanted to do, and I said, well, I'll start my own company for now, and she invested in me. And then as soon as I graduated high school, I said, I really don't want to run my own business right now, and promptly, um, I forayed my working for my high school right into working for a private school. And along the way, through a, a weaving corporate career, I sort of became a one-woman OSPO uh, over the last 10, 15 years at two different companies because there was no one filling the gap. And I think that's why a lot of us end up doing what we do in open source because we find that either there's a lack of understanding about what it means to really be a good steward to the software supply chain. And we, we identify this and we just wanna bubble it up and maybe we have a little bit of success, but mostly I think we like the challenge, right? And that's why we're all here. So I will hand it over to Rhea to kick us off. Awesome. So I like word maps. This comes from legal training, I think, but uh, we're going to just go over some high level requirements and things that NOSPO might engage in that are necessary for our own scalability. And when I talk about scalability with these requirements, I am not talking about spinning up a bunch of containers and running a pile of microservices. I'm talking about scaling to deal with all the requirements that attach to using software particularly open source software in a world that has increasing compliance obligations and regulatory issues that are attaching to that software. Then we're going to talk about just some ideas, and I would really like this to be as interactive as possible. I would love to get ideas from you. If you're in an OSPO or the Linux Foundation, Oracle, Software Freedom Conservancy, I find that one of the most exciting things about open source is that I am constantly learning in this job. I'm constantly getting new ideas. It's part of why I come to these conferences because even though I have been doing this for close to 20 years, I still learn something new every single day. And that's what makes this career so incredibly enticing. A little bit of my backstory. When I started out, I was a computer science major in undergrad, and it took about six years to finish my undergrad degree. In my entire six years, I never heard the words open source. Now, this was during the time when the GPLv2 came out, Linux came out. These are big movements in the open source world. Never heard of it. 
went to go work for an insurance company, worked for them for a couple of years. They were proprietary. So of course I didn't hear anything about open source there either. Decided that I didn't want to stay as a programmer. I was really intrigued by click wrap agreements <laughs> because I, we, this is the day when you went to the store and you bought the big box with the shiny cellophane around it. And you had a whole book of terms and conditions that would go along with your software that you purchased. And for some reason, I started reading that stuff and I thought it was fascinating. So I decided to go to law school. Three years of law school and I specialized in intellectual property, copyright and software licensing. Never heard the word open source. These are This is the late 90s. The GPL has been out for about five, six, seven years now. Never heard of open source. I didn't come into open source until I was working as a lawyer and I got assigned to a mergers and acquisitions team that was purchasing a company and someone raised a question about this open source stuff and some concern about the licensing involved and wanted to know if the purchase price that they were paying for the software was worth it or was all the stuff just already publicly available. And I got assigned to that team to look at that. And that was my entree into open source. So nine years of higher education and I never heard the word open source, which is probably a travesty for our education system, but you would think this has been solved. And I still talk to deans and law schools and undergrads today and ask, do you have an open source curriculum? And the answer is still no. And I think that is something that really does need to change, again, to make compliance and make the hygiene associated with open source more scalable because we have new graduates coming into the workforce constantly who simply do not understand the responsibilities associated with using open source. And if we don't change it at the education level, even going into the high school level, which I think is incredibly important, a uh, big fan of mentors in tech. I know there's several people here representing them. I think that's an amazing organization. I want to help them. I signed up to be a mentor. I wish I had more time to do more stuff, but at least a drop in the ocean is a drop in the ocean, right? You know, and if all of us help with that, maybe we can raise up the next generation to be more responsible about all the things needed. So let me hit the let me hit some of these requirements. So I came at open source through the license compliance view of things. And in the last 20 years, what I have found really fascinating about open source is that the role expands to touch a lot of areas. And one of the things I love is my day job is compliance, but I also get to play with marketing. I get to helping teams understand how to better use open source in a more sustainable fashion. I cross-functionalize very heavily with cybersecurity. Uh, to some extent, that's really important because cross-functionalizing within your organizations actually helps you get resources and money that you might not otherwise have access to. Uh, we are currently the open program office at HPE. We recently rebranded for being an open source program office. But one of the things that just is a reality of corporate America is that you have to constantly find ways to extend your value, prove your value to people. That doesn't mean you get more money or more heads to be able to do all of those things, but you still have to do more. You have to figure out how to scale your function and leverage whatever you have available to you to do more with less. By reaching out to other organizations within your company, you might be able to gain access to some of those resources. And right now, cybersecurity is a hot area, in part thanks to the XE and the Log4j vulnerabilities. I wish it weren't that way, but it is. And as long as it is that way, I'm gonna take advantage of it and lean in with our cybersecurity teams and work with them to figure out how can we scale our processes together? How can we combine our tooling? How can we simplify our processes across the company so that we can, and I love this phrase, feed two birds with one scone. I like that so much better than the original one. <laughs> anyway, I came at it through license compliance. So attribution and source compliance documents. These are two key areas that filter through pretty much every open source license you've ever seen. 
source compliance. And I think this is a really important topic right now because I deal with vendors who don't always want to give me their sources when they're distributing, say, GPL-oriented stuff. And I'll go head to head with them on that. And I've had vendors come to me and say, well, what do you need it for? I said, well, I don't need it for anything right now. I just want it. I have a right to it. Well, call us when you actually need it. I said, no, I don't have this conversation when I need it. I want it now so that when I need it, I already have it. And I don't have to have this conversation with you at that time when I've got a critical need. I've had other vendors try to give me a list of scripts where I have to then go download all of that code from a variety of GitHub repos. And I said, that's not good enough for me. I do want the scripts per your points earlier, Denver. I want the scripts so I understand how to put the code together, but I still want the sources. I do not want to have the load of having to go chase down all these pieces. I want to get it in a nice little tarball and store it in a box and know where it is so that if I need it at some point in the future, particularly if there's a vulnerability that needs to be solved, I want to be in control, or at least I'm not the one who's going to do the programming. Let's just be honest about this right now. I want the people who actually know how to do the programming at my company to have access to those sources. And that is really critical for sustainability, I think, because if you do not have those sources, you may not know how to do that code. You may not understand it, but you at least have a shot of dealing with it if you have the sources. If you don't have the sources to begin with, then you are entirely dependent on a third party to fix your problem for you. And you may have downstream customers that you are rely who are relying on you to deliver things that are necessary to them and if you don't have control over your own destiny you're automatically hampering yourself so ask for the sources when you are engaged with your vendors you have a right to it as long as it is a source compliance license and you should take advantage of it the thing in security that I think is incredibly important is that we need to be engaging in much more of the type of vulnerability analysis and security analysis that the Linux Foundation, for instance, with the OpenSSF Foundation, proselytize. And it's important not just because it's the right thing to do. It's not just important because it's a good thing to do. It is critically important for all companies because of legislation that is coming out in this arena. The European Union recently passed the Cyber Resiliency Act. It's about to go into final acceptance once they finish some translations. And then there's going to be a about a three year period where they're going to be developing implementing regulations for this framework of security oriented concerns that relate to selling software into Europe. On the same side, the United States has had executive order 14028 that has been around for about three years. Who here is not familiar with either the EU CRA or 14028? Okay, S bombs. There you go. That, there, that's pretty much 14028 in a nutshell, along with a bunch of other security stuff. And it's a lot of stuff that the Linux Foundation has been focusing on through the Alpha Omega project, through the OpenSSF, through the badging process that they have that you can get you can get passing and silver and gold badges for your security best practices through the Linux Foundation. Really cool program. And all of these things are just great ideas. If you're not doing at least these things, then you really have to question what you might have to deal with down the line. And the thing you don't want to have happen, a incident, this keeps cutting out. Um, you don't want to have to deal with that. If you have good hygiene, you have a more scalable process right there because interrupt work is never scalable. 
Next thing is contractual obligations. So when we're dealing with customers, frequently we'll have customers that may have concerns about receiving certain types of code or certain types of licenses. So we have to coordinate with legal to make sure that in contracts with our customers, we are making sure we are compliant with those contractual obligations downstream. We may have a customer who says, I only want originally developed code. I do not want anything from open source. I have seen that, or I have seen provisions. I don't want to receive any copyleft code from you. I just want to get stuff that's permissively licensed. We need to make sure we have processes in place to ensure that that customer is getting what we have contractually agreed to provide them. So talk to the legal department and make sure you're coordinating those requirements as well. Export compliance is important as well. This is generally another division in legal. Talk to them and see if there are areas where you can coordinate the compliance mechanisms so that you can scale those processes across and not have your users, your internal clients, have to follow seven different processes and fill out seven different forms and follow seven different workflows in order to meet all of these different requirements. This is a big thing that I've done with the security office within HPE because we originally had three different processes. There were two processes within security and one through the open program office where we were asking users to run multiple scans, fill out multiple forms, follow multiple workflows. And so we spent about six to nine months coordinating all of those processes so we could just give our internal users one process to follow. Compliance is hard enough as it is. You don't need to make it harder. <laughs> And if you can make it easier, make it an easier lift for your internal customer, follow the compliance process, they'll be more inclined to do it. And I already mentioned the regulatory compliance issues between 14028, that's uh, President Biden's executive order on SBOMs and other, the self attestation on cyber in the EU CRA, which is now winding through the European Commission process and where we're going to have a lot of regulations coming out that are going to implement that framework over the next three years. We don't know what we're going for yet. Question. That's a great question. Now, there was a huge effort by the Eclipse Foundation with the EUCRA. Oh, you want me to ask the question? Sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that reminder. The question was, with the EUCRA, what are the gradations of applications? So how does it apply to a hobbyist versus how does it apply to a reseller, to, say, a mega corporation that's pushing out software and incorporating software? And the answer is, it varies. There's a sliding scale. And the framework does anticipate having a sliding scale of responsibility. So at the hobbyist level, there are lower responsibilities, even almost voluntary responsibilities to some extent, because nobody wants liability to attached individuals that would kill open source. Eclipse had a major campaign and writing campaign, letter campaign. There were advocacy organizations that lobbied the European Commission. Digital Europe is one of them. ITI is another. Lots of people got engaged in this to at least access just not to kill open source in Europe, but there are major obligations coming down the pike. And they are going, if you work for a company, they are going to affect you. If you are a reseller, if you are a developer, if you are pushing out products, what the European Commission is looking for is a steward of the open source contained in those products. If there isn't a steward because it's a hobbyist, project, perhaps, um, if there is someone who is not taking responsibility for those security requirements for that hygiene, then you who are putting it into your product and then shipping it out the door to Europe and making money off of that, you become the steward. 
And that is a really interesting question from a scalability standpoint, because one of the things I'm thinking about is as we ingest open source, how do we determine which pieces of open source, which packages have a steward? There isn't really an easy way to do that yet today. And so I'm going to put a suggestion out there. Maybe we should have a convention of or a standard where in your repo you have a steward.md file if you are claiming stewardship for that particular project. Maybe the Linux Foundation is going to be the steward for X. They can put into the repo steward.md Linux Foundation. And then that becomes a scalable way for when you ingest that open source package to determine, is there a word for it? Or do you need to take that responsibility on to make that determination? And this is something that can maybe even be integrated into the SBOM. It could be one of the features in there. Maybe it could be something added to the SPDX and the Cyclone DX specifications. Maybe this is something that could be utilized by scanners to assess and report back on that. Chaos could report as you ingest from GitHub. And if there's a steward.md file, it could note if that is there or not. And that could be part of the community health analytics for the whole ecosystem. But we need to have some kind of standardized mechanism to assess who is the steward of these packages. So. I'll put that out there as a challenge for everyone here in the room. I don't know if anyone else has thought about this. Yep. Just maybe you could, uh, maybe you could uh, clarify. It sounds like the open source software stewards are not manufacturers. But do they mean that in terms of more like hardware versus software, or do they mean that more in terms of company that is shipping a commercial product and open source? Or is that a is that a fair distinction that's important? There's gradations to it. So a steward could be the person just developing that package and they may claim that stewardship and claim those responsibilities. But ultimately, if you're selling products into Europe, then, and this will be developed through the regulations. I mean, right now we've got a moving target. We don't know what these regulations, what these implementing regulations are going to look like. But where I think it might go is that this situation will require an entity that is shipping software, including that open source, to take on those responsibilities to effectively become the steward if there isn't already a steward in place. Right. I mean, I maintain someone who might be the steward, yes, but if you are, if that person, that maintainer is not complying with the cybersecurity obligations that are going to be developed, then there may be still responsibilities that attach to the um, to the person actually pushing the software out the door. We're going to see, Jim. Go ahead. the viability of this so And keep in mind, when you're talking about supplying an end piece of software, they get what they get when they get it. So if they don't have a maintainer file, if they don't have sustainer information, if they don't have that in some other way, what do they have? They have a copyright, maybe. 
they have a project that they can find on GitHub, but they're digging around. So that's why, you know, the call out to have some kind of file to identify this is it works in two directions, right? It's going to help the original creators or the original copyright holders to not necessarily be that person because they're no longer involved in the project, perhaps. You know, it's just, and then it helps the receiver to understand, okay, if, you know, for lack of a better term. How does this steward? I'm unfamiliar with these. How does the stewardship concept here relate to liability for these things? Um, like, if you are a steward of this piece of software, someone else uses it, um, and an incident happens, whether it's actually your fault or not, or a misuse of your things, how does it tie into liability, or how does it? And was that going to, as an open source person, I wouldn't want to publish something if I'm liable now. That is an excellent question. Now, I should have caveated this at uh, the beginning of this, which saying I am a recovering lawyer, but I am not currently practicing law, so nothing I say in here can be legal advice. And the answer to your question is it is really to be determined. I mean, the implementing regulations are what are going to tell us how this is really going to work. So pay attention because this is all going to be coming out in the next three years. The European Commission said, a deadline. Uh, there's a few things that go into effect, I think, a year from the passage, which was, it was about April of this year. And most of the stuff is supposed to go in effect in about three years. And the scary thing about this is, is we have to develop processes and we're going to have to develop auditing mechanisms and we will have to have documentation and training that go around all of these implementing regulations. And we don't know what they are yet. So. It's going to be exciting times. <laughs> and it's the same thing with the self-attestation and 14028 with the S-bombs. So Lynn and I have both been contributing to a community group within the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, that has responsibility for implementing 14028 and is the one promulgating the self-attestation documents and requiring the S-bombs. And we've been developing various papers and guidance around doing this type of compliance within the US. And it's important to be paying attention to this stuff because this 14028 applies to selling to the federal government. At some people have told us, oh, well, we don't sell to the federal government, we're selling to you. So we don't have to worry about making an S-bomb. And I'm like, no, 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 you do need to have an S-bomb because to the federal government, or we have customers who are selling to the federal government. Everybody at some point is connected to the federal government. So you know what? S-bombs are the rule of the day now. <laughs> do you want to talk about that? The whole CISA group? Right. So I think, you know, when the... When the presidential announcement came out, I remember presenting this to my C-suite and saying, hey, I'm, I'm trying to light the alarm here. This is coming. We have to do this. And I've already been working for three years to try to actually properly document all of the dependencies in our code. And I haven't gotten any buy-in from developers yet to help me with this. What are we doing? How do I get steam behind this? And it was like, well, we're going to form a committee and we're going to think about it. And here we are down the line. And it turned out that, okay, they weren't wrong. They had time to think about it. But now their time is up. And the problem that we're really working on with CISA now is that you don't have the right tools to do what you need to do as a developer. And even worse, on the other side, you don't have the right tools to ingest this information if you're not a development organization. So as we kind of go through the, these slides and the last slide, think about your role in the software supply chain as a whole, your company, you, and what it means to, to bring all that information together. Because the information that you need to deliver with your end product, it exists, you already know. 
someone knows all of the tendencies, maybe not the same person, but if you collectively got it together, that information exists within your organization and can be worked into your processes in a way that doesn't bottleneck you. And that's what we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but when we talk about cross-functionalizing and networking, within your organization, there are already people that care about this too, right? I was in a role of IT procurement and IT asset management. And before you say, why are you in this room? Um, we really care about all of the software in our environment, not just what we have to pay for, what it comes with, what our developers are running to make code. If you're in an organization that is only a consumer, you still care about open source that's in the proprietary software that you're buying. So this is something that these these people within your organization have already been thinking about, but they may not have known that, oh, the guys on the observability team, part of cybersecurity, they also want this data. They want this data before we buy the software. So if I'm in, I'm working in my department and I want something, I, I want this new platform, I want this new tool, and I have to go through my IT procurement person, my ITAM team, Am I allowed to get it? Approach it <clears throat> from their perspective too. Like, okay, we're going to get this. Ask for a software bill of materials when we go to buy it so that we can all evaluate it together. Get together with your cybersecurity team and say, okay, if we get a software bill of materials, how can you ingest that into software do you already have a way to bring that into your software what about the t the tools that are monitoring your network for other purposes or managing for other purposes they probably have some functionality that can either you to and contribute to what you deliver if you're a development company or help you analyze what you get in as a consumer bring those together and you want to talk more about Thank you. <laughs> One other thing there to mention is that even if you're just internally using software, it's still important to get those S-bombs as Lynn mentioned, because I have had teams come to me and say, we will only use this internally, or we're only going to use this swear, in the cloud. Swear. We're never, ever, ever going to distribute this. And six months later, guess what they want to do? They want to put it on-prem on a customer site. And at that point, we're trying to recapture and backfill to be able to fulfill those obligations. Maybe it's a year later. Maybe it's a year and a half later. It doesn't matter. If you don't get the stuff right at the beginning, you're facing a fight and that's not scalable. You are not scaling your process. You're dealing with interrupt work. You're dealing with t tasking people to go chase after things when they would rather be doing something else, get it from the beginning, have the process in place, and that way you're in control of your own destiny wherever that destiny leads you. That reminds me when I was trying to build an internal software catalog at, at a company so that people wouldn't just go download things. They would actually look to see if we already had something to do that function. Is another hidden benefit of software bill of material and part of all open source hygiene is why do I need 20 open source applications that all do the same thing? And how do I find that out? Now that's something that your SBOM will tell you without somebody manually touching it that knows a lot about software to say, oh, these two packages do exactly the same thing. Why are we using both? Um, but unfortunately, all of your SBOM processes still need people to touch them. So if you have the right person touching them, they will tell you that. Now, when I went to build this catalog, the funny part was I wanted to put a license disclaimer on everything so that everyone could just read, this is what you can do with this software. You can do use it internally. We can redistribute it. And the, the, the support team, the internal support team said, why? Why do they need to know that? And I'm like, we're a development organization. So if they just see that all of these are available, how will they know what they can and can't develop with? Well, come on. I'm like, okay, 
uh, is somebody okay to incorporate Notepad++ into our application? Are you okay if we just have them do that? Think about it. And then, oh my, you know, you saw their eyes open like, okay, wait a second. Because there are all these people in your development organization that don't do development. So they don't think like a developer that's thinking, this is a really handy tool that has open source code. Why can't I use it? Well, we're releasing a proprietary product. So not in this way, according to our lawyers. One of the things I want to check on, is anyone in this room currently participating in the CISA meetings or know about the CISA meetings, the community meetings? Are you in them, Jim? No, I'm no, but I'm not participating. Okay. I encourage all of you to look at this because Lynn and I just went through a fight that lasted, what, the last three, four months oh. on getting the recommended form for the SBOM to include the license and the attribution, the copyright text for the components included in the SBOM. And here's why we were fighting for this, because I want to scale the processes. And what I would like to see is that the SBOM become the attribution document effectively. Because if I go to Teams or worse yet, if I have to go to a vendor and say, not only do you have to produce an SBOM for me, but you also have to produce an attribution document for me, I'm going to have a double fight on my hands. Oh, I want one document to serve all my compliance purposes, but that means the SBOM has to have all the right fields in it. Oh. I don't know. Is it too loud? Is it booming? Sorry. All right. Sorry. I'll, I'll go back to that. But the point is, if you're not involved in these community groups, and these are great places to network, by the way, if you're looking for people who are concerned about cybersecurity and open source and how to engage in these and the problems that we're trying to solve in them, these community groups are incredibly inclusive. They are dying for people to be involved in them. There are multiple meetings that take place every single week. Now, it's a little overwhelming. At HPE, we had to divide and conquer. So we have a number of people tasked with attending specific meetings, and then we regroup, and we have a joint meeting, and we share everything that we learned in the weekly meetings. But let on developing the things that you in your software supply chain should be for tooling, whether it's open source tooling or proprietary tooling to be able to divine the information needed to create those SBOMs. And then we're involved in another meeting on Thursdays that focuses just on how do we construct the SBOM itself? What fields go into the SBOM? What should the standard be? And there's people in the medical industry, development, services, financial, all across the board. And we're all wrestling with how to solve these problems. These meetings are also, by the way, attended by CISA personnel. Now, they can't act in the capacity of CISA. They're not going to disclose where the government's going. But they're hearing what we're saying, and they're understanding what the industry issues are. And it is a golden opportunity to try and advocate for your positions. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to www.cisa.gov backslash SBOM and learn more about those meetings. They're also hosting SBOMorama in September. <laughs> you like that, huh? Uh, SBOMorama, this is, I think, the third or fourth one of these that they've hosted, but this is going to be in Denver, Colorado. Uh, they're going to have a vendor toolcase, a vendor showcase one day with a whole pile of vendors who are trying to solve your SBOM problems for you. But if you're looking for a solution, it's an opportunity to investigate you can use Lynn's document that she's working on right now on what kind of questions you should be asking them to see if they can solve your problem or advocate for things you want them to add and include in their tool suite. Right, because as I said, there's right now, there's no silver bullet for this. You're not gonna find the SBOM platform that's gonna bring in your SBOMs, disseminate that information across your organization and then help you to generate your SBOM to deliver your end customers out. So what you want to think about is 
when I'm bringing in software and I need to bring in an SBOM with that, what formats can I accept? Can I accept SPDX, Cyclone DX, NIP4? There are options. Should I be looking for a tool that will work with more than one? How agnostic can you be? Um, but um, keep that in mind in all parts of the chain. Hey, um, can you name a specific security problem, vulnerability, or bug that is easier to fix by having the SBOM than it is having the complete corresponding source code to the entire? My answer is all of them. I think about log4j and yeah, do I have all of my do I have all the corresponding source code for every single application in all of my environment? Is it easier to get that or easier to get a bill of materials to scan through? But An SBOM is, is not meant to fix. An SBOM is meant to bring the knowledge. And it's not just a security document. I, I get kind of a you know, ball in my head when people say this. It is a risk document. So we're not just looking at the security risks. We're looking at the legal risks, at the compliant, all those risks that we mentioned above. Uh, you still need it. No, no. So, because they still have to comply, have to provide source code if they're running GPL applications. I mean, that actually, the, the requiring proprietary providers to provide a software bill of materials, you're leaving them with nowhere to hide. So they can hide that they're using this open application that provide you the complete and corresponding source code of their application because of now. So that is the good part of it. I was I was going to second uh, what my seatmate wound up saying, which is as an app application security person who responded to instance like Log4j, uh, with a few thousand internal applications, yeah, like the, the big question was, how do we sort through this quickly and efficiently instead of uh, using like the GitHub search function, which I've had to do for plenty of apps that we don't have in our internal SBOM inventory and, and other tools. Uh, like, a, you know, and usually we're just trying to figure out, do we have it, what version, and can we update to a known good version instead of where is the code and how do we fix it? Because it's usually somebody else's department. That sounds like you've got a pretty mature situation there. All right, I'm going to respect everyone's time. So we are at, I am happy to stay and answer questions. This is a weird microphone. Uh, I want to put one last plug projects. Uh, Eight Knot is built off of uh, an account project. It's some really nice graphics on how. Analytics. I got introduced to this Open Summit a few months ago. I love it. A little tool that helps me communicate outside of the 
open program office to others about the health of projects in a very neat visual package that uh, so promoting that well, a project from the Linux Foundation, huge fan of that too. They're working really hard to solve problems with both the most widely used open as well as the most the microphone over, but and answer any questions. The work you've done in C and you can reach us. You're gonna hold it back so I don't so I don't boom. <laughs> There's our contact information. We did produce these slides using Microsoft PowerPoint using the proprietary disclaimer. So apologies that I didn't use something open source. I was a little lazy when I put the deck together. But I'm delighted that you came. Happy to be here. We'll be here all week. <laughs> <laughs>